Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we transition from worshiping you through singing your praises and symbolically remembering the death and the resurrection of Jesus, to now we're worshiping you through attentiveness to your word. We ask that you would remove distractions. Maybe it's the, the distraction of being tired because there is a lot that's gone on this week. Maybe it's something we brought with us, some worry, some health issue. Or maybe it's something that might crop up here. We'd ask that you would remove all those distractions and help us to focus solely on you, hearing from you. We ask that you would speak through your word and that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds, that you would help us to understand truth and apply it properly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This week has indeed been crazy. I'm so thankful for all the volunteers who have spent countless hours putting everything together, uh, both in the sound booth and, as you know, I I try to get Carrie to enter this way. You might notice something new and then point up, yeah, the new speakers, and then kind of pretend that, you know, that was the big deal. But really, it was uh, my sense of humor. But really, there's been a lot that's happened this week. But among that, there's also been lots of stuff in the body, lots of stuff by, by that I mean... Bill, who's always sitting a couple seats behind me, is in the hospital. You know, lots of other people are going through health issues. And there's been lots of phone calls, lots of distractions. There's also been lots of challenges as well in the midst of this very busy week. And I think some of that was actually spiritual warfare. Because of all the messages that I've preached so far in Philippians, I think this is the most important one, especially for the American church. Because I don't think we balance out the two things that we're going to look at today very well as a whole. I think we actually do that very well here but we need to constantly be remembered or reminded of it. It needs to be remembered. So I'm going to dig in and just kind of refresh you. We've been doing a study through Philippians, and I'm going to refresh you on one of the key themes by looking at one verse in Philippians 1 and one verse in Philippians 2. And then if you remember two weeks ago, we did testimonies last week, but if you remember two weeks ago, we kind of dipped our toe into Philippians 3. We're going to get there again. We're not going to get very far, but we're going to examine some of those verses we just kind of touched on and a theme that that brings about. So uh, I'm going to have the words on the screen. That's up there just so that people online have the same screen that you guys do. Uh, Helps us out. But the words will be up there on the bottom of the screen. But feel free to open up your Bibles and look in there. And we'll be in Philippians 3 in just a moment. And you can always turn and follow along if you like. 127. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Then in chapter 2, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And so... Paul has built this theme of unity, and he's talking primarily to a church. As I go through and I talk about unity today and the balance of being on watch, as we're going to see in just a moment, with unity, I'm primarily talking about a church, and Paul is primarily talking about a church because they're doing life together. They're having meals together. We want depth in life here, not just a smile and a way, but they're doing meals together. They're calling each other. They're emailing each other when there's a need. They're letting one another know, and they're doing things together, like you know, going to the park or going. Our youth went to Six Flags together not too long ago. But they're living together, not just a smile on a Sunday morning, right, or sitting near each other. But they're actually doing these things together. And as they do, this kind of stuff applies to the family too, because as they do, they occasionally encounter problems. Right? Two weeks ago, I said that the problem with unity is people, right? And it's very often true. But I really focused then on our personalities and our maybe our own desires. James kind of talks about this as well, in that often what we want gets in the way of being in unity because we're not putting everybody else in front of ourselves in an appropriate way. Instead, we're, we're focused on me. And if we all run in the same, you know, if we all run in opposite directions, then it's hard to be unified. And we talked about that a little bit. But there's another way that we can be not in unity. So I'm going to read kind of our key verse today, our key verses today. And then we're going to go on and we're going to look deeper into this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. That see, many 
Many pastors model themselves after Paul. Finally, and this is only the third chapter halfway through the book, and then he also says that he has no trouble repeating himself. Uh, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Now, dogs here is kind of a, an insult originally used by Jewish people that were insulting the Gentiles for being unclean. It meant wild dogs. So they're out there. They're being wild. They're not behaving right. But Paul's actually using it of Jewish people. And his original audience would have known this are, are largely Jewish people. There might have been uh, some weird Gentile convert in there who bought into this idea that to be a Christian, you needed to go through and follow the entire Old Testament law. You need to be circumcised, which is a little different when you're an adult male as opposed to when you're a baby. And, and you needed to do all these things to get saved. And they made it a salvation issue. And he's telling them to beware of this. He's telling them to be on the lookout for people whom would have called themselves Christians who have even already been inside the church. And yet he also has this theme all throughout about unity. So how can we balance being on unity and being on watch? Because we are to be what the Bible calls watchmen, right? Ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. We do need to pursue the truth and we do need to confront things that are not true. But how do we do that in a way that promotes unity? Well, sometimes I see these discernment ministries. And I see things get taken in a way that we begin to eat our own. And we do so in a way that isn't edifying and isn't loving. And I'm worried about that. And I see that a lot in the American church. As we are busy fighting amongst ourselves, sometimes on non-essentials, there are people around us that don't know the gospel. And that frustrates me. We do need to dig in deep and we do need to talk about these things, but we need to do it in the appropriate and loving way. Let me tell a story about my dog. This is my late dog named Puddin, and she is the cutest yellow dog ever. And I called her my teleologically perfect dog, and that's a weird, fancy way of saying she did everything that a dog was supposed to do. See, I was a philosophy nerd and student at the time, and that's what I, I like to call her because she did everything a dog was supposed to do. When I was sad, she comforted me. When I went on walks on the family farm, she kept me company. And she also, as people came into the family farm that I lived on in Kentucky and trespassed, she also was the guard dog. And she would growl and she would bark. I can remember a time when there was just somebody working on some electric lines and she barked and threw a fit to let me know that I was there. And, you know, they're like, you know, tell that dog to hush. And I'm like, no, no, no. I want this dog to let me know when other people are here. Because on my family farm, if you guys didn't know this, I was kind of a redneck, right? I come from Kentucky. But on our family farm, we had been shot at by trespassers. And we even had to escort people off or draw and fire at one point at people who were trespassing on our farm. It was a wonderful area. And unfortunately, it had gone south because drugs had come in to a neighbor's house. And it went south from there right? But she was our protection, our first alert system very often. It reminds me of the story about somebody who had a guard dog in kind of a rough area, and they had a friend over, and that guard dog growled at that friend. And they said, well, you know, I'm your friend. What are you going to do if that dog bites somebody? And they said, I told the dog you were okay, but until I tell the dog that, if it bites somebody because I haven't let them in, I'm going to give it a stake because its job is to protect me from the riffraff that might try to break into my house. You know, oh, that's kind of interesting. But that was the job of the guard dog, right? Well, Puddin never bit anybody, and she wasn't that vicious. In fact, she loved you. She might, you know, like want attention from you and all this stuff. Um, but she was a guard dog because she had to be, because we did have some riffraff around. But later on, I moved to Alaska, and she stayed with my dad for a while, and then I moved to Ohio, and she came and lived with us. And you know what? There, and, and when she lived in Mississippi, I noticed that even though we were in a safe area, she was still a guard dog. Even though that a lot of the danger had passed, because we didn't have bad neighbors anymore, she was still extra cautious about new people. And she had lost some of that puppy friendliness because she had to toughen up a little bit. And it was hard for her to soften back up and meet and trust new people again. And I think sometimes we do the same thing, right? And even in our church history, we had to fight against heresy when we left a denomination that really did totally reject appropriate salvation, right? So we left that group and, and you know, separated that out long before I got here. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. But Sometimes we still fight, and we fight with the, or the fierceness 
of that topic on lower or smaller issues that we don't have to fight that hard on. We might bark too fiercely at the wrong person in a way that doesn't actually help things out. I was talking to my pastor friends. I have a Thursday Zoom, and, and currently it's my turn to lead a book. And so I'm reading through one book, but um, it came up this discussion about unity and things like that. And Adam, one of the friends there in the group, he recommended this interview by a guy named Francis Chan. Now, I knew Francis Chan, right? When he first burst onto the scene, he was a megachurch pastor who then left that megachurch because he thought their focus was on the wrong things. And he, he said something like, I thought Jesus wouldn't come to my church. And so he did not um, think it was appropriate to continue. He left, became an author, has done some work with uh, human trafficking. He's continued to minister. Uh, and I really liked a lot of what I heard out of Francis Chan. And he has written this book called Until Unity. And so I picked that up this past week. And every time I open this book, um, somebody called or texted like it was, it was as if there was this drive, a spiritual attack to prevent me from reading the book. Now, I'll be honest, I did not get to finish the book, but I got a lot of the way through. And I found it kind of humorous that I was reading about unity from Francis Chan because a few years ago, Francis Chan started saying some things like, ah, oh, I think he's losing it. He's getting a little squirrely. I think he could have said that better. Oh man, I can't believe he said that. That, that was not very smart. But in this interview, when it wasn't a quote taken out of context, he actually provided some of that context and made a lot of sense, and I really appreciated him. It doesn't mean I agree with him on everything. In fact, there's quite a few things I disagree with him on. Even in the book, sometimes I wrote, you know, like, what did he mean by this? Could I ask him a question? If I could sit down with Francis, you know, maybe he could have said this a little better, right? Or, or maybe he used, he made the right point, but he used the wrong verse to make that point. And so I'm not saying that he's perfect, but overall, I read this book and I found a lot to agree with. And I was really excited about it. You see, sometimes when we talk about unity, there is this cringe inside of the Christian world about unity. And I've heard it from another pastor's friend's lips. I've seen it. And they've said, people say they want unity. What they really mean is they want, you know, to not have to argue. They want something shallow. So there's no, you know, there's no depth. That way everybody can get along. Uh, real unity is uniting around what's true. Well, that's very clear, but sometimes what they really meant when they said that was real unity is uniting around what I think is true, <laughs> which is a little different. Um, and it's very clear. And so I think, I think we can have both truth and unity, depth and truth and unity. Let me explain by a meme. How many of you guys recognize this little girl? You guys might have seen her shared around on Facebook, things like that. Originally, it came from an old El Paso commercial around September uh, 2009. And she originally said this, why don't we have both? It got, it got uh, boiled down to just why not both. But in the video, there's some Spanish speakers, and they're talking about the, the benefits and the cons of hard shell versus soft shell tacos. So this is very important to bring up on a Sunday morning, I know. But hold on, stay with me for a second. And or, um, Old El Paso or whatever, they were, they were advertising their new kit that had both. So as these two people are arguing about what they can have, she says, well, essentially, why not both? And they lift her up on the shoulders and they parade her around. And, you know, they celebrate her wisdom because she didn't see it as a false dichotomy of one thing or the other. There could be both. And I think we can have both. In fact, we can have more than those two things. There are three things that Francis Chan points out that we actually need. He says, many Christians who want unity don't value theology, right? So that's the head stuff, or holiness actually acting it out. God commands all three. Absolutely. Amen. So maybe we could rephrase the little meme to say this. Why not all three? Right? We could, we could actually pursue all three. And we want to do that. But first, let me underscore how important it is that we pursue unity, right? Again, this applies to us as a body of believers. It applies to us as friends. It applies to the coworkers. It applies to your spouse, because you're going to passionately disagree with some of those people, right? And you have to be able to move forward despite that. So I got to tell you, I had to cut a lot of verses out for time, but let me just highlight a few of these things, of these verses, 
Proverbs 6.16, there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. That's a Hebrew um, kind of poetry method of just escalating at one. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. God hates someone who's spreading strife among brothers. Paul to Timothy, who's kind of the junior co-author of Philippians that we're studying now. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with a doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions. So catch that. He's wanting unity on the key things, but then he's also, he's also um, warning against this morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And here's another infamous list. Let's look at Galatians 5.19, also written by Paul. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. So take note of that little section. Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarn you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Did you catch how seriously God treats unity and those that would break apart unity? It's a big deal. We need to pursue this very intently. It impacts our eternal status. Now, of course, that doesn't mean, you know, you spread, you cause one fight and you're out, right? It's not that. These are people that are constantly spreading these kind of things. So as we move forward, we need to think about how do we pursue unity while at the same time warning people about bad and false ideas, so let's, let's start with this. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we need to worship in truth. Acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. That's Proverbs 4, 5. So we must be on a pursuit of what is true, not maybe what we've been told, not what we'd like would be true, to be true, we need to pursue actual truth. And we need to recognize that as we're on that pursuit, other people are on that pursuit of what is true too. And as they are, they may be in a different spot in that journey. So we should have some grace because we can probably remember when we got some things wrong. And so we should have some grace in that. And we need to remember what is the essentials and what is not. So Jesus says it this way, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. We need to learn what Scripture says are the central issues, not elevate inappropriately something that is not a central issue. And boy, have I seen that done. And we'll get to a personal example of that in a minute. But we should avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strifes and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. Knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. And so he's giving us some examples here about what we should avoid, right? We shouldn't be fighting about some of these things. We don't want to major on the minors. And as we engage with each other, as we figure these things out, we need to be open to wisdom. Here I'm going to use the ESV. I normally use the NASB, particularly the NASB 95, but Here I'm going to use the ESV. I think uh, they translated one particular phrase a little better. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. If you want to pursue unity while disagreeing with somebody, don't automatically assume that you are right and they are wrong. Listen to them first. Hear them out. Right? We need to gather the information. Sometimes, as Dennis Prager says, clarity is better than agreement because at least you got a starting point then, right? We have to actually know what they are saying. And sometimes there are loaded phrases that have connotative meanings that, that beyond just what they actually mean, they carry some weight to them. And so you think, well, I've heard 
that word used by these people, and they mean this, maybe you do too. Well, hold on, maybe you need to dial in more. And then once you've figured out what they actually mean, you need to examine that with Scripture. Acts 17, 11, Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, this is the Bereans, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scripture daily to see whether these things were so. So ask questions. This is uh, Luke recording that Paul goes and he's presenting the gospel to these Jewish people and they're examining. It's not a culture of don't ask any questions, right? Or don't dig in. And unfortunately, we have some of those cultures even in American Christianity. Here's a guy named David Pullman. His YouTube channel is Faith Because of Reason. Uh, he's since uh, bumped over the 1,000 subscriber mark. Uh, but I've recently engaged with him a little bit. He's in some of the same like groups that I'm in, and I don't agree with him on everything. I'll tell you that right now. But I got to listen to an interview from him about a shocking way that he grew up. And he grew up in a church, but this church was very different than our church. His, his church was more like the old school, we don't drink and we don't chew and we don't go with those who do. You guys ever hear that? It had that same kind of idea. And in fact, he was in college for this denominationally associated movement. He was in a college associated with this movement. And he had a pastor get up and give all the students a kind of a sermon. It wasn't a typical class, a sermon. And in this, he discussed what the pastor called doctrinal pornography, which is a strange term, right? I hope that perks your ears up. It did David's. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What he's comparing here does not need to be compared with that sin. But the whole message was, hey, you Bible students that grew up in this particular denomination, every other Christian out there, they're all wrong. Don't you dare even read their books. Don't you listen to them. Don't you talk to them. Don't you try to figure out what they mean. You just listen to me. That doesn't sound like being a Berean at all. Conformity is not unity. Silence and surface compliance is not unity. Real unity goes beyond just having a disagreement and figuring things out. We're going to be more unified when we dig in and come to the same conclusions or agree to disagree, but both know that we've legitimately dug in and looked for truth. But that was a shocking thing, and it's maybe less uh, obvious, and maybe it's more subtle, but that kind of thought is around. And we got to got to buck that. You can ask questions here. And it was also a denominational thing. I grew up kind of in a denomination, and sometimes that becomes that. Rather than going out there and reaching for Jesus, reaching the lost for Jesus, it's the Baptist versus the Methodist or whatever. And those are two groups that I'm associated with in some way or another in my past, so I can pick on them for that. 1 Corinthians warns about this in uh, chapter 3, verse 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? We shouldn't be looking at this whole camp and going, I'm here, you're there, and our, everything in my camp is right. And we do that sometimes. We have to be Bereans on individual issues. So you want to pursue unity and truth at the same time? Take it issue by issue. Don't make it a big, broad chunk, as we do sometimes. And remember, when it comes time to actually address a brother or a sister when they've got a disagreement, remember this. Romans 13, 8, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Or as, to uh, quote Francis Chan again, we need to stop thinking that our primary duty towards our fellow believers is to critique them. It's not. Our primary duty is to love them. Now, we can love them by telling them they're wrong about something. But if we do that in the proper order, we can lovingly address the issue. Sometimes it's not having these discussions. We need to have these discussions. We need to learn. It's the way we have these discussions. Can you imagine what the impact of the world would be, on the world would be, uh, if they looked at Christianity and saw Christians behaving differently, both inside the church, inside work, even in their marriage? If they, as they fight, you know, right now, if you look at the country, half says the, you know, the other half is communist and the other half says the, the, the half is bigots. And, you know, we've got name calling back and forth. There might be some different options between just those two. But imagine those people fighting, and then they look over at the Christians, and they're having some of those same passionate disagreements, and they're not raising their voice. They're not screaming at each other, and they're not throwing each other punches. They're not name-calling, and they say, I love you. Imagine a young couple, and they're having marital difficulty, and then they look at an older couple, and they're, they're disagreeing. 
They totally have two different plans on how to handle an issue. And yet, they're not screaming at each other, and they say, I love you, and then they move on. And they don't just dwell there and sit in it. You know, I've seen some of those things, and it's like, did I just witness a fight or not? It kind of sounded like they disagreed, but they still clearly love each other. What if we modeled that to the world? What would the impact be? Well, they would want what we've got. Right now, they don't always want what we've got because they think a lot of what we got is just what they got. We've got to be very careful about that. So as we pursue truth and unity, let's think about how we talk. Proverbs 16, 21 says, The wise in heart will be called understanding, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Understanding is a fountain of life to one who has it, but the discipline of fools is folly. The heart of the wise instructs his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. This kind of circles back to, you know, ask for clarification. Greg Kokel, borrowing from Columbo, he says there's a Columbo question. When you hear something and you don't agree with it, start off with what do you mean by that? All right? And then you can go, have you considered? You know, you got to go a little deeper. But first, you got to make sure you're on the same page. But maybe if you could prevent using some confusing words, maybe you could toss out the theological jargon, and try to be clear in your speech. That will help unity. How many fights in a marriage or how many fights in a business or even among friends do you find out later after asking a few questions you actually had way more in common than you thought and you just spoke a little wrong or used maybe the wrong word? It happens, right? And when we do talk to somebody, we're not going to win them over to the truth by beating them upside the head with anger. We need to be persuasive with how we say things. And this has been summed up, and originally it was in a different language, but here is the initial translation, in what is necessary unity and what is not necessary liberty, and in all things charity, or as we might know it a little better, in essentials unity, in differences liberty, in all things charity. And this is important that we have this attitude among one another because Scripture teaches that our influence on the world is directly tied to the unity we display. Or as John 13, 35 records, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We are in this together and we have to be very careful with how we approach other people whom God loved and made in his image. There are things that we need to address. There are essential issues that we, you know, like this church left the denomination many years ago because they were violating on the essential issues. And there are even secondary things that are really important that maybe, you know, maybe we're still brother and sister in Christ, but maybe we're not going to end up going to church together because we're a little different. We both think each other saved, but maybe we're not going to agree to the point that we're probably not going to worship together in the same place on Sunday morning. Okay, true. But that doesn't mean we have to be nasty to one another. We have to do things in love. I saw a really cool thing. Uh, Speaking of not, a minute ago I spoke of not using a word. I caught myself using a word that we had just talked about on Friday men's group after it was all over. And I was like, oh, I used that word again and it has some meaning behind it. And I know that this other group that we had just talked about was using it wrong. Just like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses share some of our same terminology but mean something very different when they use certain of the terms. Like Jesus is God, they would say that, but they don't mean the same thing that we do. Um, So keeping that in mind, I kind of, you know, oh, I should have said that better. But actually, I saw in the conversations we had in Friday men's group this past Friday that we didn't all agree on some things. And you know what? We talked about it. We smiled. We laughed. We moved on, right? They weren't the essentials. And so we learned from one another, had the attitude, well, why do you think that? Let me check it out. Let me listen. (laughs) <laughs> and then maybe even, hey, I disagree, and I'm going to pray for you because you're wrong. But it was still loving, and that's a beautiful thing. I think we do that well here. I want to model that. I want more people to experience that because there have been people that have been hurt by churches because they have a bajillion long list of checklists that they have to believe um, just to even come in the doors. I've talked to people, you know, open communion is a big deal for us. Uh, because there have been people who, hey, they've been a Christian their whole life. They go into a new church, you know, they want to partake in communion, and they're told, uh, no, you haven't gone through, you know, our four-stage, four-hour membership class, which we're going to have a membership class soon. Or, uh, oh, you're, you want to be a member of our church? Well, you got baptized in a different denomination. You got to be baptized again because they don't know what they're doing. And I've had that happen. And that's not unity. That can be very discouraging. 
It's important that we have unity because even in this town, there are admitted 73,000 non-Christians in this town. Admitted, right? And you know some of those people in those surveys click Christian, and they're not really Christian, right? They just they grew up in a Christian home or they believe in a God, but they have no personal relationship with Jesus. We've got work to do. We can't spend time sweating the small stuff. We should, we should dig in deep. We should learn. We should worship God with our mind. But we don't have time to fight about the non-essentials. We could use that time for reaching out to the people who so desperately need Jesus. We're a team. Let's preserve that. Let's do it together. Let's preserve the unity in your marriage and at your work. Let's be different. Let's be salt and light. And even when we disagree, promote unity that goes beyond just surface level um, conformity, but to loving people even when we disagree with them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to dig in. Help us to balance these out. We're going to have more opportunities as we go into next week to see some of the things that we need to be on the watch for, but also help us approach those things with love for the individual, making sure that we don't confuse having ideas as enemies and having people as enemies. Help us if we're, to, if we're to be ministers of reconciliation, we have got to be reconciled among ourselves. Help us to have community and from that place of love, address the wrong ideas that are in this world. Help us to share truth in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.